Hi, I'm Emma Lavalio. Hi, everyone. I'm Spencer Cook. I'm Erin Root. Hi, I'm Graham Rowe. And today we will be discussing our journey to making a modern recreation of a magical Four Five Voices by Orlando de Lasus. The performance practices and the general music styles of the Renaissance period have been fortunate enough to survive as knowledge to the present day. The average musicologist will be able to have access to enough knowledge in order to draw a rough conclusion on what a Renaissance era piece might sound like. However, the music community is made up of many more individuals and groups than just musicologists. Indeed, the musical community is made up of an innumerable number of performers, educators, composers, and producers. Even on SU's campus, we see a multitude of different musicians that are all doing a multitude of different things. As such, without a modern interpretation from a musicologist who is aware of the notational systems of the time, which were indeed very different from the contemporary system, performance of a piece from the Renaissance would be especially difficult. Therefore, this project was designed to complete a modern edition of A Magical for Five Voices by Orlando Lassus. This group shall discuss the life of Orlando Lassus, the original music he composed, the text that has been set to his music, modern interpretations of his music, and creative reasoning behind our own modern interpretation of de Lassus's work, given the performance practices of the time. In order to gain a better understanding of the circumstances in which de Lassus was writing, firstly, we shall explore de Lassus's life and career as a composer. From an initial evaluation on the works of Rolanda de Lassus, many scholars of musicology would have to agree that we only know very little on the movement of Orlando de Lassus and his activity as a composer. He spent a total of 10 years in Italy, where he grew to manhood and formed a respectable personality, which led him to secure employment and earn him the title of one of the leading composers of Europe in the 16th century. While it is clear that he had eventually made a name for himself, it is not clear, however, if he had studied in a particular way with older composers leading up to his first publications. Without an idea of how or whom he studied under, it is hard to say or imagine the importance of certain musical influences that may have impacted his earlier works, though his various works did lend themselves to being very useful for scholars of 16th century music. It is fair to say that De Lassus must have already written a great amount of music. However, his madrigals, specifically the four voice madrigals and those of the first book and second book of madrigals for five voices, date back to his years in Naples' modern day Italy. As a younger composer at the time of the publication of his five voices madrigals, five voice madrigals, he did remarkably well. Numerous reprints of these early magical collections provide sufficient evidence to show his success. Although there is evidence of Orlando Lassus' success, his magical entitled Fiera Stella is most likely one of Orlando Lassus's less appreciated works. We made this conclusion for multiple reasons, one of them being there are no recordings of Fiera Stella, and there are very few modern editions besides our own. We feel that Fiera Stella is unappreciated simply because of the origin of the Magical's text. The text used for Orlando Lassus's Fiera Stella is a poem from Petrarch's Canzoniere. In fact, Petrarch was crowned the first poet laureate since antiquity, showing us Petrarch's fame. The Canzoniere is a very beautiful collection of 360 poems where Fiera Stella is number 174 in the collection. As we can see in these pictures of the canzoniere, the poems are decorated with beautiful pictures that give the reader a vision of what the text is talking about. Additionally, it's interesting to note that de la Sousse could have used a version of the canzoniere to help write his magicals. This collection of poems often mentions Petrarch's love for a woman named Lara, pictured below, who could be a real person, 
but historians are not completely certain whether she was real or a fantasy. Historians believe Laura, if she's real, is the woman Petrarch first saw at the church of St. Clair in Avignon. As we can see in Petrarch's poetry, it mentions a love interest who the poet is pining for, and this lover is someone who can heal the poet's hurt, most likely from previous experiences mentioned in the poem. It is known that Petrarch used themes in relation to his own personality and his secular and religious values. Therefore, this beautifully written poem speaks of Petrarch's life journey and even his love interest who seems to be able to heal him. Part one of Fiera Stella reads, Cruel the stars, if the heaven have power in us, as some believe, under which I was born, and cruel the cradle where I lay once born, and cruel the earth where my feet then walked, and cruel the lady who with her eyes and with her bow, favoring me as a target, made a wound. Love, I'm not silent about these things, since with those weapons you could heal my hurt. Part two reads, but you can take some delight from my sorrow. She does not, because it is not far worse. Being only an arrow wound and not a spear's, I console myself that to pine for her is better than to join another. You swear it by your golden arrow, and I believe you. As is generally customary for works from the time period, Delasso's work has been repeatedly subject to addition and revision. Modern notational systems combined with the generally accepted practices of education that come with said system can make reading notation from the Renaissance particularly difficult. However, enough modernity can be found in De Lasso's work to create a revision into a format that the contemporary musician can perform and read. One of said modern editions was created by Franz X. Haberl. He is, of course, German, and we have his portrait right here on the slide. Published in 1894 in Leipzig, Germany, his modern edition makes quite a few changes from the original part books from 1555. One of the most notable notations, as you can probably suspect, was the change to score notation instead of the original part books. All parts are visible at once to the reader, allowing them to see the implied harmonies and interactions between the different voicings. Using C clefs for the upper three voices, this edition also sees rhythm and articulation being notated using the contemporary system still in use today. This modern edition of the piece would be published within two major sources, the Classical Scores Library Volume 1 by Breitkopf and Hertel in 1894, and the Complete Works Editions. Classical Scores Library Volume 1 contains many compositions of De Lasso and other composers and includes Hobborough's version of Fiera Stella. Complete Works Edition, originally published in 1927 in Germany, is simply a complete collection of all of De Lasso's work. This also contains Hobborough's edition. Dynamics were a consistent problem for writing this modern in interpretation. As one can see in the original published part books of the piece, there is effectively zero mention of dynamic contrast. As such, this group really did not have much to work with. The first major mention of dynamic contour was written in 1597 by Gabrielli, almost 40 years after the publication of De Lasso's work. Many of the dynamics that this group included are based off of the performance practices of today's musicians. Given this, the dynamic characteristics of performances of the time cannot truly be known. However, the dynamics which are included in this group's edition add a lot to the performance aesthetic value of modern musicians. More information regarding the subject of dynamics will be discussed later. Another fact that must be mentioned is the lack of modern recordings. This group has been unable to locate any recordings of the magical Fiera Stella, meaning that either no one has recorded this magical or no one has put the recording on display over the internet. This is both a hindrance, but also a blessing. While there are no recordings for which this modern edition can be based on, this also gives the performer freedom to choose how to perform this piece. This can be very useful as a marketing tool for ensembles that wish to perform a work that has not been recorded yet, effectively setting the precedent of any performances to follow. 
So one of the biggest decisions our group had to make when writing out the modern edition of Fiera Stella, as well as Matu Prendi, was the organization of the voices. We decided to rename the voices since the original score used some outdated terms. What we would usually see in a modern score is soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, and bass. The names in the original score of Fiera Stella line up respectively with SATBB as cantus, altus, tenor, quintus, and basus. For the baritone voice, also known as Quintus, we decided it may be easier for the voice part to be read in treble clef with an indication to sing down the octave, written the same way most tenor voices are written. These few changes make it easier for modern ensembles to perform the piece. I'll show you that now so you understand exactly what I'm talking about. You'll see on the left, um, it's written, like I said, the way a more modern piece would be written, soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, and bass. It was originally hard for us to decide what dynamic decisions to make. The piece had no recordings and no dynamics were written in the original score as dynamics were not a common practice during this time period. However, once we started dissecting the translation, it became much more easy and natural for us to agree upon what should be stressed and showcased. In the beginning of Fiera Stella, the lyrics reflect the stars in which a child is born under. This is a very sacred description and thus we wanted the dynamics to reflect that calmness. Furthermore, the voices come in staggered, and so we wanted them to gradually build in dynamics. You can see the voices start piano, and with every staggered entrance, they gradually build in dynamics. Similarly, multiple held up notes or any melisma in the voices may have had a crescendo, etc. Fiera Stella specifically has very diverse lyrics. I'll explain that in a moment. So I'll first show you these entrances, as mentioned, start off piano, and over here in the alto voice, there is multiple notes held out that one word. So we had them grow in dynamics. And then as these entrances become, uh, start over again and they're still staggered, they grow in dynamics. So now instead of coming in piano, we come in mezzo forte and that continues on pretty steadily. Now we're coming in forte, etc. So as I mentioned, the lyrics are pretty diverse. Um, the opening of the piece talked about the sacred parts of life. However, later in the piece, the lyrics address a cruel lady who with her eyes and her bow favored me as a target. This holds a lot more aggression and passion than when we were talking about the stars. So the dynamics also reflect that. There's lots of accents seen in all of the voice parts as they sing the words Fiera Donna, in English translates to cruel lady. I will again share my screen so you can see those voice parts. Um, let me just find that really quick. Mm. Here we are. Um, you'll see all the voices, the soprano part in those last two measures have Fiera Zona and those have accents over it. The alto is just before that and they had the alto part had more held out notes so we had them crescendo and decrescendo um, any, anywhere where they had those longer held out notes, they, we gave them room to grow. That way it didn't become super flat lined. Um, so you can take that in for a moment. And uh, like we mentioned, the melisma over on the left, you'll see measure 21, the alto part had those held out notes um, for a while. So we had them give, gave them a lot of room to grow there. Um, yeah, stop that share. For Matu Prendi, there are far less melismas in the piece um, and it is much shorter than Fiera Stella and has far less lyrics in it. Fiera Stella has a lot of, a lot of words, but uh, Matu Prendi was kind of repetitive in its lyrics. So this again caused a hurdle for dynamics and finding emphasis points. However, we followed the melodic structure and contour of this piece to guide us. Similarly to Fiera Stella, the entrances were often staggered. So naturally we had the entrances grow in dynamics as they occurred. I can briefly show you that. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the beginning, all the voices come in piano. And I decided, uh, we decided as the, um, when we were discussing the piece, as the male voices come in, um, the female voices often tend to overbear the male voices. So at, as the lower voices came in, we let them come in just a little bit louder, nothing too crazy. Um, but just, you'll see in the beginning here, the female voices, the treble voices come in piano while the bass voices come in uh, mezzo piano instead. So just a slight difference, but enough to let their voices be heard. 
With the notational system, it was easy for us to work out pitch and rhythm, but uh, emphasis was something more of a bother due to the performing practices of the time. It's not unusual to find parts that do not share a common meter. Emphasis is often placed on a downbeat in contemporary music, whereas the concept of a downbeat does not often exist in Renaissance era music. As such, the addition this group came up with features several rhythms tied over into different measures. Emphasis thus cannot be placed clearly on a downbeat. As previously mentioned, this group has been unable to locate any recordings of the magical Fiera Stella, as well as not Matu Prendi, meaning that either no one has recorded this magical or maybe no one has, you know, just put it on the internet. This was a hindrance and a blessing. While there are no recordings for this modern edition that we could have worked off of, it also gave us a lot of room to make any creative decisions we wanted. And even for future performers, it gives them a lot of wiggle room in what creative decisions their ensemble decides to make. This can be very useful for marketing um, as ensembles wish to perform a piece that has not been rec yet recorded. So effectively they set a precedent for any future performances that follow. Since up until this point, this group has discussed the background and procedure for creating a modern edition of De Lasso's work, a lay scholar may wonder why it is so important for such a modern edition to exist. If a musicologist can adequately understand the notational and performance practices of the time, surely they would be able to disseminate a performance of that work using the existing score. This logic is inherently flawed indeed, needing to learn multiple notational systems would be a barrier to the performance of the piece from its original score. The strain on an average musician not focused on musicology of the 16th century would be immense should they be forced to read, perform, and interpret a score from that time with no prior knowledge. Thus, this group score solves a major problem related to the written language of music. Through the four centuries separating the contemporary world from Orlando de Lasso, the music notation system in which musicians convey musical ideas has changed and evolved. Just like how languages change and evolve, Latin fragmented over centuries into Spanish, French, and Italian. The system in which musicians convey their music has also changed and become universal. Though the study and effective translation of antiquated notation into the modern system, musicians all over the world are able to enjoy and perform pieces that would otherwise require an, imme an immense amount of work in order to merely read. However, this group's interpretation includes a feature that fundamentally transforms this piece as a whole and makes it much more marketable to modern musicians dynamic contrast that corresponds to the text. De Lassus composed most of his music within the 16th century, a time in which the text of a work had an immense impact on the characteristics of any given piece. Madrigalisms and other techniques involving rhythm allowed for heightened interest in the subject matter being sung. This group's interpretation takes this text painting one step further the dynamic contrast present in this group's interpretation coincides with the text to place far more interest on the subject matter being sung about. For example, the line, I fiera con la do, dove nato giacli, I don't speak Italian, I am sorry, which translates to English as, and cruel the cradle where I lay once born, contains a noticeable decrescendo to reflect the humble and simple beginnings at the start of every human life. We are returned in the music to our very infancy. This group also made use of dynamical contrast in order to make the syllabic stress more apparent. For example, on the phrase, E fiera donne che con viocci suoi, again, I don't speak Italian, I apologize. There features a noticeable crescendo decrescendo figure. This shows the reader of the score that emphasis is to be placed on the first part of the word donna, not only showing the stress of the syllables, but to also heighten interest in the word. Dynamic shifts are also present in many other places that may feature melisma or long tone-like holds on certain pitches, 
These create contrasts where contrast may have had no other chance to take hold and to attract the listener to said contrast. Having access to a score brought back and translated into modern notation from its archaic or original form is a benefit to the entire music community. It gives performers new repertoire to perform. It gives arrangers and composers new material to base their own on that would otherwise be lost to history. It gives publishers an economic incentive to record and sell said recordings and Lastly, it gives the musical community as a whole the opportunity to take a figurative step into the past. Writing a modern notation of Fiera Stella offers the musical community at large the ability to perform something that would otherwise have been lost to time. It gives the modern audience the ability to hear what our ancestors from over four centuries ago were hearing.